Okay, it is 2.30. We will go ahead and get the study session started. Mike, you have any opening comments, or we turn it over to Natalie? Uh, well, I guess I can make some opening comments. Um, you know, as part of last year's budget, we looked at the health insurance fund balance and uh, uh, the target balance and what we were experiencing, and we took a kind of a holiday for a little bit in terms of making payments and transition that to the general fund. And then as part of this year's budget conversation, it came up again of where are we at on the fund balance and is, that, is there an opportunity there? And, and I told you at that point, I really wanted to look at it a little bit more systematically and, and consult with uh, our consultant on the topic to come up with a strategy as it relates to the timing of when we would look at making that kind of decision and, and how we determine what our reserve balance should be and then how we might apply ourselves if we, in either instance, whether we're uh, exceeding the, the target fund balance or below it. And so Natalie's co uh, coordinated with Bob Charlesworth, with Charlesworth Consulting, who assist us with our health insurance plan. And we talked oh, a couple months ago and kind of talked it through and I think came up with some, some good uh, items for your consideration and a pretty good strategy. So Natalie's going to give you a little bit of an overview of our health plan and, and coverages, and then we'll turn it over to Bob to talk to you about reserve balance as well as uh, upcoming insurance renewal. So with that, I'll turn it over to Natalie. So like Mike said, just wanted to give you a brief overview of our fund uh, and, and the components of it and some of the elements that we manage within it. Um, we established this fund in 1996. That's when the city opted to go um, to become a self-funded employer. And I say self-funded. Technically, you could consider us partially self-funded because we do purchase some stop-loss insurance, and we'll get into more of that later. And we do contract for administration of our claims um, to be paid on our behalf. But how we work in terms of our insurance is we do charge internal premiums. We get contributions from both the city as the employer as well as our employees. We split that. And then you might recall in addition to our employees and any of the dependents and spouses that they have the ability to cover with our plan, we also cover our subgroups, which the housing authority, the public library, um, the airport authority, and then our retirees. There's three different elements within the coverage. We have it currently carved into medical. Our third party administrator is Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas. They also provide the stop loss for us. And again, we'll get into a little bit more in detail. Uh, prescription cover coverage is by Elixir. They just recently had a name change for MedTrack. They are prescription benefit managers. Um, so. And then uh, in addition to the medical and the prescription, we have dental, and this has been Delta Dental of Kansas since the time that we became self-funded, I believe. Um, we really only have one plan, so it isn't that people opt in for different levels of coverage. We have one plan, and then they can opt to cover an individual only, an individual plus one. That plus one could be a spouse or a child, and then uh, a full family. In terms of what that coverage looks like, our medical coverage is a 50-50 share plan. Um, that means we share the costs with the employee, the plan and the employee divides that, um, up to reaching $2,000 individual and 4,000 family. Now, with the Affordable Care Act a few years ago um, and a change of structure, we had a lot of um, services that are considered preventative so even though we say things are covered 50-50, there are a lot of services that individuals have access to that are considered preventative, and therefore our plan would cover it at 100% with zero cost to the employee. Currently, our prescription coverage is a 30-70 split. The employee or plan member covers 30% of that. Uh, the city picks up the other 70%. And then Delta Dental, we just have a maximum benefit set aside for dental work. That's 1,500 per plan member per year. Um, a note with the uh, ACA maximum out of pocket, and we see this mostly 
with the prescription and the medical, um, even though there's 30% to the plan member and a maximum of 2,000 individual, for example, once they hit 8150, um, for the most part, their, their um, coverage is, that, that's capped out. So that is their maximum out of pocket. Um, the city doesn't have that, uh, any maximums set there, and, and again, we'll get a little more into that soon. I wanted to give you an idea how we are charging those internal premiums. Um, information provided for both full-time and part-time, it's about an 80-20 split for employee versus city for full-time and close to a 50-50 split for individuals that are classified part-time. Like I mentioned, the um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas is our third party administrator for medical. And along with that, um, we pay fees for each individual that is enrolled on the plan. The, the, those fees cover not only administrative fees to process the claims, but also the stop loss. Currently that stop loss is $150,000 per individual. So in the event, um, medical issues cause claims to exceed $150,000. The city no longer has the obligation to pay for that individual. That's where the stop loss, stop loss insurance picks up, and that's through Blue Cross Blue Shield. That's medical only. And then, in the event um, we would have collectively just not one of our best years, if our claims hit 130% or higher through Blue Cross for medical for our whole group, then we are no longer funding those claims and that's where the stop loss picks up there. Point of clarification on yes. that. It says 130% above, is that above or of? Because it makes about 100% difference. I believe in Mr. Charlesworth's presentation, he says of. So 130% above would be the attachment point would be at $230 if we had $100 in expected claims. If it's of, it's $130. So I should have phrased that different. So Did you hear him? Really, that he, that is, really it should of, say of. Okay, thank you. Could I just, and, and that is the whole group, and not for an individual person or employee, but group-wise. Okay. Correct. At the time that we renew the contract with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas, they provide us the number of here is what they project to be expected claims, and here is the calculations. So here is the point at which okay. um, the stop loss would would pick up. So they they provide that in an actual dollar amount at the, at the re, with the renewal documents. Um, uh, just a, a sidebar: Blue Cross Blue Shield um, does have very good discounts, and we factor that into. Um, as contracting with them, the access to those discounts has saved considerable amounts of money for our plan. Do you mean, do you mean negotiated rates? Is that what yes. you mean by the discounts? Yes, provider discounts. Negotiated so, rates. Okay. Um, you know, for example, a, a doctor's office might typically charge $150 per office visit. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas may have a contracted rate of 125 So they write off that $25, and that's the most that plan would be charged. And then a little bit about our fund. Um, we had deemed that our target balance was at $2 million. As of the end of September, our target or our fund balance itself was 2.897. So we have had the luxury of having that trend above. Um, current plan year is February 1 to January 31. And then I did provide a historical perspective as far as where our fund balance has been on a monthly basis over the past few years. So where we need some guidance and some structure and some policy created is what happens or, and when should we be looking at that fund balance and what actions should be taken? 
Um, and we, we need some guidance, and those are going to be some of the things that I transition and ask Bob to cover um, some different approaches and to also get uh, some feedback from you. Um, you know, what, what should that balance be, and when should we be looking at that? And then in the event it's higher or lower than we would like it to be in terms of target, um, you know, what do we do? So with that, I'll go ahead and Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Charlesworth, Vice President of Charlesworth Consulting. Uh, we're at 1828 Walnut in old downtown Kansas City, Missouri. Yeah, of course, I'm working out of my home in Olathe, Kansas right now. So uh, thank you for having me this afternoon. Uh, actually, it was not a bad drive coming out at all. A little bit dicey around Lawrence, but other than that, it was pretty, pretty good weather so far. Uh, today, I want to talk really about two major topics. Uh, the first one being is uh, fund balance, reserve fund balances. Um, the uh, $2 million was kind of a talked about number and I thought it would be important with Mike's direction probably be important to talk about how do we come up with that number put a little bit more um, uh, specifics as to how it's calculated and that way we can all get an understanding of what is at risk and what is not at risk I've got two concepts here outlined for you to look at and I, I would like some discussion, or you can think about it, whatever you'd like. But let's walk through them just briefly. Uh, I'm going to touch. We're going to touch on this a little bit, uh, a little bit here. But the um, the uh, amounts that the city takes as risk. Uh, we talked about specific stop loss per individual at $150,000 per contract year. And then an aggregate, the worst case scenario for all claims, all combined for that same contract year. And yes, it's 130% of expected. And so you look at that corridor, what you expect and what the worst case scenario is. And that is an aggregate stop loss attachment amount, that corridor, if you will. So one concept is we take one month of claims for up and down swings. As you saw the claims experience that Natalie had, Claims go up and down. Matters what large claims may happen when they're paid. Uh, right now, we had a dip because of the COVID claims. A lot of those services were were they're waiting on it until uh, now to start their uh, normal procedures uh, to kick back in. I know I had one delayed from May until August. Um, so there's some up and down swings in claims. A month and a half of claim for terminal liability, and what that is is this a little different, a little asterisk at the bottom. If the city would ever make a change of carriers to go fully insured, to do anything else, the city is still responsible to pay claims for when you were self-funded. Now, you may get a claim in December, but not pay it until February or March. Well, the contract's already ended. So you have the responsibility to pay that. That's what I call terminal liability, or claim run out, if you will. That's calculated every year about one and a half times monthly claims. If I took a lag report of this very city's, you would find it would be about 1.2 to 1.3 maybe. 1.5 is an easy number. That's where that amount comes from. And then you look at, and we have an example for you to see for your renewal in just a minute, where, you came, where I came up with this $1.5 million magical number. What that is is actually where the carrier comes in and says, we expect your claims to be X. You know, we'll go over those numbers, $3 million. Worst case scenario is Y. That difference is about $1.5 million. Why? Because we don't know what our claims are going to look like. So we have to have some cash flow possibilities. If you just add all that up, it's $2.4 million. The other concept is, you know what, Charlesworth, that's fine. But we have reserve dollars already. We have a month and a half of claim terminal liability. Our intent is not really to term claims, but we need that money available. And yes, we have the aggregate stop lot attachment at risk all the time. So that's a million and a half. So let's leave it at two million, in this case, two million, fifty-two thousand dollars. Thus, the concept a minute ago, good number is two million dollars. 
Well, this is actually a calculated number that we can do every year. So those are concepts that I've come up with. Now, a while back, before we could get a lot of claim data, uh, there were some what they call safe harbor limits, and that's changed terms now. But the IRS kind of says, you know, you ought to be about 30% of annual claims, blah, 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 plus administrative costs. And uh, that could have calculated to be over $3 million. Well, today, with claim data that you can find, you can see what our, the city's lag reports are, our terminal liability is, and everything else. So really, it's, this is very known, and I can calculate every year. So this is the concept that I'm laying out for you to look at today. And now, in a minute, we're going to talk about what do you do if it's short, and what do you do if you got too much? But I think the, the, the concept right now is, where does the city want to look at regarding, this is where we're comfortable with our claim reserve for our health and RX fund. Now, in a minute, the reason I wanted some higher limits, I'll be candid, is that we've, talk, we've carved out the RX program years ago to the stop loss, so the city had some elevated risk on pharmacy claims. You really haven't experienced elevated risk until this year. We've had, and I've got that information for you. A little bit of a bump, but my point is, is that it's time to probably consider rolling that in to your Blue Cross plan instead of having it carved out. So the city has the protections of stop loss, but right now you do not. That's why I was pretty hesitant about not saying, yeah, let's make it at $2 million. Let's come up with a calculation. And by the way, these calculations do include the pharmacy costs that I'm talking about going forward. Again, when to calculate is a good question to have. Uh, Mike uh, grilled me on this one. I thought it was appropriate. Uh, so what do you do if you have positive monies? Well, you, I mean, you're the city commission. You all can decide what you want to do. But, you know, one of them is declare a premium holiday, perhaps in October, to be realized in December. It's just timing. In other words, premium holiday employee, we're not going to take your, the, your contribution out of your check. You're paying 30% of that amount, we're just not going to do it. We're going to waive it. Why? Because you've done great. This is your reward for managing your claims. Uh, we can buy down renewals with it. If it's just a little bit of money, we can say instead of increasing our rates 5%, let's increase it 3%. City pay 70% of it, employees pay 30% of it, but we both win. So you can buy down renewals that way. It's one-time monies. Uh, you can create a health reimbursement account. That way employees can have that with their current plan and they can use that like a flexible spending account and other things. A little cumbersome, can include some fixed fees. If it's a sizable amount, that's a nice alternative. We don't see that a lot in my business. But it is an option. Uh, and then of course a percentage of city contributions can be swept back to the general fund or wherever you get the funds of which you, you do, which you use. Um, but I think it's important that, we, that you realize that some of those dollars are obviously employee contributions and city contributions. And the reason that they're positive is through employee engagement and utilization. So um, if the city says, you know what, we're just going to take it all and sweep it, I have no issue with that. And the reason is the city has the financial risk for this plan. The financial risk is on you as a city. So that is one thing uh, to think about as well. So the, the flip-flop of that is, is, okay, what if we have a bad year? And you can't have a bad year. Um, let's see here. Sorry, I've had some. I know back in um, 2017, uh, there were three claimants over $150,000. So obviously every claim up to 150, the city shoulder does in your costs. Well, this year you're at zero. <laughs> it's knock on wood, doing great. Uh, last year you had one, uh, two years go two. So it does happen, but they can be negative. So I don't want you, the city to say, wow, we had a shortfall of easy numbers, you know, $100,000. We're gonna add 100,000 to the rates and share it all. Well, you can do that. Or you can take and say, you know what, based on the fund balance shortfall, we'll take 20, 25, 30%, whatever, and add that back over a three to five year period. In other words, ease back in to 
We had a bad year. We're going to modify that a little bit going forward to help build that fund balance back to two men, 52 or two or whatever numbers you all decide. Point is, is that there are actually ways that we can monitor this every year for you to see how it should look. Now, um, I don't know if you want to talk about that, but I've got your renewal information here. It might be helpful to see that first so you can kind of see what we're predicting for the future. Uh, my Ouija board's pretty good, so, <laughs> and Blue Cross's numbers were, were good. But here's a quick summary of the 2021 forecast. Uh, Blue Cross actually expects your claim cost on medical side to go down 3.57%. Yes, we had some really good claim years so far. Is no that, claims through September for large claimants. Compared to? To what they predicted for this current year. So which, they predicted a certain amount this year, and for predicting next year, they actually think it's going to be down 3.5%. And that, that includes it, medical trend. Yeah, so if 2019 was the last real year, I mean... Correct. There's a, there's a lag, but they do take... Well, I mean, the, as far as non-COVID, I'm, I'm, yep. personally, you know, I have a lot more money sitting in my flex account right now than I sh well it's good that I haven't had to use it but I'm trying to say oh what do I need what to do get I need? done mm -hmm. you know, and I can't imagine there aren't other folks in that area but but a lot of stuff just hasn't been getting done so when it bounces back it's going to bounce back to 2019 not to 2020 it can and they some insurers are predicting that to be about a five percent swing so even, but they've taken that into your consideration based on your claims through, uh, I believe it's through, through June when they calculated this. Because they let claims develop before they go act and actually predict the future. Mm -hmm. Now, here's my, just on that very issue, the next one is the pharmacy claims. I pulled the information up from your current provider. It's actually claim payments are down 6.7% from the prior year. Um, but I'm actually projecting up 5%. And so when you look at that, it says, well, I ought to see a rate decrease or funding decrease on that. I'm going, no, I'm not, because there's some large claims in there that we've seen. I'm going to touch on those in a second. And there are some that have been, you didn't get the services or we don't know. And claims costs on pharmacies are going up that it's going to be hard to predict in the future. Um, what portion of our uh, of the premium is allocated to pharmacy costs? It's about 25%. About 25. Yeah. Yes, sir. So when you talk about 5% up, you're talking about 5% of 25%. Correct. Which is about a 1% overall. Correct. Okay. And then the administrative fee is up 3%. Uh, just in a minute, we'll, we'll, we'll show you those actual numbers. So administration fees are claims administration. Uh, Blue Cross going out and getting the discounts, uh, negotiating the pharmacy network discounts, et cetera. Uh, Three percent, uh, the administrative fee is about 10 percent, 12 percent, not even that much. Probably eight percent of your overall cost, so it's a very little number. And then your stop loss premium actually went down 15 percent. You may recall last year when I was sitting here, we got an increase and we're going, why? Well, we did have not a good year, but we're having, we, I say we, the city, is having a very nice year. And Blue Cross st statewide has done okay. Uh, they're a little concerned going forward uh, because of the number of the large pharmacy claim issues that they are starting to see. But that premium did go down. Now, the expected claim number, as you can see, is only down a little bit. But that actual premium to transfer that risk under 150,000, or excuse me, above 150,000, that premium went down, so that was a nice addition to see for the city this year. I'm going to have two options for the city to look at. One is a renewal of the current program, and how that is allocated is Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas has the medical and medical only stop loss. So when we talk about medical only stop loss, anything that is handled via the medical claims, which could be in, inpatient, outpatient, how that's managed. All that goes up to that $150,000 stop. Anything above that, Blue Cross pays. But the city pays under 150. dollars Elixir, which is used to be called MedTracks, handles that pharmacy benefit program. 
And again, the city has the full RX claim cost exposure on that. Option two is to have Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas include their pharmacy program, which is called Prime Therapeutics, and eliminate Elixir. This way, that risk of that stop loss can now include pharmacy claims. Now, as you can see, the net add is about $124,000 of fixed cost. So if you look at me and says, Bob, over the years, how come we haven't done that? Well, because we've saved about $130,000 a year in premium, pure stop loss premium to accept that risk. My concern today is how pharmacy drugs are looking in the future and the city's specific claims experience. My recommendation would be to consider moving it all together. Again, this is a stop loss summary. 150,000 per contract period, <coughs> medical claims only. Option to move the pharmacy program to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas. And then the aggregate stop loss is 130% of expected claims. Of course, now the stop loss is up a little bit from what you may currently see. Why? Because it's 30% added to pharmacy claims when before that was not the case. So it skews the numbers a little bit but at least the city would have full protection at that point. I wanted to show you some pharmacy expenses, large claimants. I, I pulled the, the, the top five claimants. Obviously, I don't get names, and I, mean, I would never share them with you anyway if I did have them. I don't know who they are. I don't know if they're uh, employee, spouse. I don't, don't know. Don't care. Uh, I just want to make sure that they get their claims and they get paid and the employee gets taken care of. But as you can see here, on claimant one, two, three, four, and five, the number of claims that they incurred, what the plan paid. Now, if, if this claimant number one didn't have any medical claims whatsoever, and they may not, except their daily, you know, when they go see the doctor, you know, twice a year or whatever, that's $176,000. Well, the city could have stopped that claim at 150 if it were included today. Now, we, the city would have paid another $125,000 for that feature. But this way, if we look going forward, second claim is 147. And so, as you can see, this is kind of a year that while our claims experience is good overall, we are starting to see a little spike in what we consider pharmacy claims. So we have only one claim that qualified for stop loss. It would have. It was under the yeah, stop loss. Yeah, that's Cor what correct. I'm saying. Yeah. And and this is the first time this has happened in the history of the program. Based on my knowledge, it's about right. I'd have to go back, Rod, and so double check. We've been but in this since 1996. Not not carved out like that. Okay. Yeah, it was carved out in the early 2000s. Yes. Roughly 20 years. Correct. Okay. And on this, the third column. Are those just, I'm sorry, just the pharmacy expenses? Correct, sir. So no office visits, no? No office visits, strictly pharmacy claims. And that's what the plan paid, which is the city. Again. Are these negotiated rates? They're not because we're not going through Blue Cross. Oh, no, they're, they're fully negotiated. They are. Yes. Okay, the, the pharmacy claims. Correct. Okay. Uh, as a side note, uh, sir, I did compare the pricing discounts of each of the firms, and uh, the Prime Therapeutics is, is slightly better. Okay. I didn't share that with you, but it's, it's filed confidential data, but I can tell you that it is slightly better. With the employee, I was getting ready to say patient, but as the employees... Uh, share of the cost of the drug at the pharmacy the same under the two different Correct. plans? They do. And, and of course, if the discounts are better, it actually helps the employee right. since they're paying 30% of it. Do you know right off the top of you, and just your, your personal judgment, are the formularies equivalent to each other? Is one a lot more restrictive than the other? Uh, we can get more restrictive, but that's not, what I, that's not what I asked them to provide. I asked them to provide as broad a network as we could get. So there are there is room to control the formulary closer, but I'd I'd, I'd like to see the dis disruption report first before I would recommend that. 
Because well, see, you as, might... as, as I get older, I'm going to see it wider. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Personally. Exactly. Well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think so much, I mean, the formulators are important. Yes, I get that. I, I think the, the management of the claim is the most important. Um, you know, to make sure that they are getting the drugs that, that, that work. Uh, you know, yeah, I want the, the best discount I can get, but I also want something that, you know, I don't want them to give them a 90-day supply when after 10 days they figure out they can't use it. Right. I'd rather them manage that more so than just, you know, oh, we got a little bit better discount or controlled. Makes sense. So, but that is something that, that the city will need to review as it goes on because those formularies are getting more restrictive because um, it's expensive. So. so just from a simple math, if, if the premium t or the extra cost to include the pharmacy and the stop loss is $120,000, we would have to have that many people up, up below the 150 we're paying anyway. So it would be the excess, it's kind of like health expenses on adjusted gross income, but it's, it's only that excess over the 150 that's going to count towards was the 120 a good bargain or not. That's correct. And right now it's, it's very hard because I cannot combine the two datas with individual IDs to figure out what that crossover would have been. So that second one at 147, did they have medical costs of 100? Well, that'd have been 247, and then the city could have gotten essentially $97,000 back from stop loss. I figure this is just pharmacy. This is just pharmacy. Yeah. So, the, so the medical would push a lot of those over the it 150. Could. Uh, I mean, it, 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 uh, you know, if you look at the actual drug that's issued, some of those can be already paid for right now with Blue Cross because they're done in an inpatient setting. And this is not an inpatient setting. Right. So. I mean, the, the city has some protections there, but it's 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 just it's just easier and more controlled, and gives us more data to review to make sure that we're doing the best not only for the city but for the employee by combining those together. But I'm just showing you some of the risks the city has taken, which is fine. We've saved we the city has saved that premium. So even if it is just the one person, well, you, you would have spent 124,000 to get, you know, 26 back. Well, you're 100,000 up. That, that's presuming the medical side didn't drive it over, and we have no way of knowing that. Mr. French, and, you're exactly am correct. Am I correct in that? That is correct. Okay, so it's not fair to say we're saving $25,000, but we're going to spend $100,000 more on premium. Correct. Uh, even though we've only been hit this way in one year out of 20. You can't make that an apples-to-apples apples comparison. That is correct. Absolutely. Well, thank you for rescuing me because I was about to do that. Because <laughs> that, that way makes no sense. So then we don't know who else would have had medical bills of 110000 yet low pharmacy costs. Who would have? I'd have to go back and get individual reports on every individual on both the pharmacy and the medical and combine that somehow. Or at least look at the significant claims in each, and then, right. and rather than co compare right. every single right. one, you can. Because mm -hmm. that stop loss is individual; it's not per family; it's per per person. Per person. Mm -hmm. That's correct. But as you can see, just from this slide, whether you know it was included, or I, I mean, if it would have been just that piece or not, you can see the volatility of it. And to me, that's what I'm concerned about moving forward. I would rather have that volatility and control under one document with stop loss protection for the city, especially if we're looking at establishing a fund balance at X. That we would control what is at risk and what is not at risk. Uh, this is just an FYI. This is your pharmacy pay claims, year to year comparison. Speaking of which, do we. Uh pay differently for generics than we do for brand name? Uh, meaning what, sir? Uh, is, it, is it still a 70-30? Still a 70-30. That way the employee makes a decision, can make a decision. I'd rather have the brand, yeah, it's fine, you pay 30% of that cost. Yeah. So you have to ask the question. But it also costs the city 
a bunch more. And some of the pricing on the brand names are, are pretty uh, um, attention getting. Uh, very. Yeah. Uh, just as an FYI, I don't want to be mean to the incumbent on the pharmacy. Uh, we do get notifications on large claims to have the city review that. Is that appropriate? Do you understand it? Yes, yes, yes. So it's not like they're just willy-nilly approving everything all the time. So they're very controlling. Uh, uh, that's controlling. They uh, do watch your checkbook. But um, again, Blue Cross expects the city's claims to be about 1.3 million uh, for next year. Um, probably a little light. Uh, but when we see the totals, at least you understand uh, where those claims are coming from. Uh, just an interesting stat. As you can see, the employee pays about 16.7 percent. Well, excuse me, 16.73 per member per month for employee what the employee pays. Um, and if you did the math, uh, city pays about 85 percent. Employee pays about 15 percent of the overall cost. So, as I'm getting way ahead of the game here, but I, that's kind of what I do. Um, this is 2022. Uh, we are going to talk about 21, and we're not going to go, go away from that. But we've had a lot of discussions with city management to talk about, you know, when we get our renewal, when can it help in budgeting processes. Uh, if the city would look at a January 1 renewal, uh, right now you're February 1, uh, which is fine. Uh, January 1 obviously is the most prominent renewal date. However, we can probably get, and not probably because I have other public entities that have do business with Blue Cross of Kansas, get early renewals in July to help in the budgeting process. So when we project forward, the city has a better idea of not only what the reserve fund should look like, but what the future of your claims may look like from their perspective. Uh, and that way it also follows calendar year benefits. So we talked about this in work session last year. I want you to let you know it did not fall on deaf ears. But I think uh, whatever the decision is made by the city on your renewal to go forward, I think what I'd like to consider for next year's looking and directing Blue Cross of Kansas to move to a 1-1 one -one contract period. That way we can get the renewals a little bit earlier. Um, what, in, what kind of impact, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'll, I'll, I'll remember my question, you, okay. go ahead, yeah. Because I'll probably <laughs> forget mine. What impact does that have on HR staff in terms of switching to a 1-1 one -one renewal date? Is there a, I mean, does that, does that put any additional stressors um, for you all or? Yeah. Um, there's actually some benefit to it in addition to um, having the, it align with budget. Um, I believe we can take advantage of some efficiencies in our new software that we can set some things for plan year and, and do some different adjustments that we haven't had the luxury. Um, I will mention Jennifer Perry, our benefits coordinator, uh, one of my staff members. We joke she also has other titles informally as life coach and employee advocate and about 15 others because of how many things she does for our employees. But I'd have her comment if you have any other thoughts on the change. I actually think it will be better. Okay. Uh, just, it'll be better for employees because most of their spouse plans. You want to come up here? You want to come up and speak at the microphone, please? actually think it would be an improvement. Um, little work up front, moving open enrollment around, but other than that, I think it would streamline things to fit better. I mean, other plans typically renew 1-1, one -one, so we always have the confusion with employees and figuring out spouse plans. Um, so I actually think it would probably work. I guess, the, you know, the, the other way to look at that, uh, my wife happens to renew March 1st. And uh, I know physicians hate January because everybody's in their deductible. So there's very little cash flow coming into a physician's practice in January and February because all the plans reset. If you're trying to get stuff done at the end of the year and the doctor's on vacation, uh, you can't get it done until January. Well, guess what? You're on, your deductible's been set back to zero again. Uh, or actually set up to 3,500 or whatever it is. Uh, you know, so there's some practical 
reasons to not have you know worry about big cash out of pocket right after Christmas when most of us probably have the least amount of cash in our pocket. Um, I mean, just th there's another side from the consumer aspect. I can understand having spouses' plans on the same calendar it makes it easy from the counting in, uh, but there is a, a, a cash flow disadvantage to having it so early in the in the year. Yeah, I would I would I would point out that's a little bit moderated in our plan because we have a 50/50 copay, not a full deductible to a specific amount. So that's somewhat true because you may have be over your copay maximum at the end of the year, and there, but it's 50/50 instead of you know a, an 80/20 or a flat deductible to start the year. But you're still working so, toward that maximum of whatever it was, $6,100. On the 50-50 yeah. copay, yeah. That resets. That does, but remember that 50-50 is on the medical piece. That goes 50 up to 2000 Yeah. So it technically stops at 2000 The only way to get to that out of pocket is through pharmacy costs. That stops at 2000 out of pocket. For the medical side. So it's actually $4,000 worth of bills. For, for, correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's correct. Discounted build. That's correct. And just as an FYI, um, it's a good comment to make. Uh, the share pay plan that the city has, it's 50-50 from dollar one. Right now, I, the Kaiser Family Foundation uh, survey came out. The average deductible right now is $1,644. Well, nobody has that specifically. It's, so about $1,500 deductible. Well, the challenge, Dr. Yuji said it specifically there, the employee has to shoulder the entire $1,500 plus their premium before they ever see a benefit, besides the 100% care under the Affordable Care Act. That's, so that's a given no matter where you go. Mm -hmm. So the complaint we had for years is that I'm paying all this premium, I'm not getting any benefit. So with the concept of high deductible plans where the employee shoulders even a bigger amount, like I do, I'm on a high deductible health plan, 100% of that I have to pay. 100% including drugs. So I'm very cost, cost conscious. At least with the share pay, you're cost conscious from dollar one because it's your money. And so it's half you, half the plan. So at least you get something. It does cost a little bit more. Why? Because there's an immediate benefit for the employee. But it, it's, again, we're talking about $2,000 versus you know a higher deductible. So. It's not a huge, cumbersome cost impact on the city's plan, but I'm telling you, it's a phenomenal benefit for the employees. And it does make them consumer conscious too. Right. Uh, again, we don't have to decide this today. This is something that you know we can say, just look at that as it unfolds. Fine, we'll get the numbers early and have that discussion. Is there any industry data on tendency of people to delay preventive oh. care because of that 50, the higher that 50, uh, that share percentage goes up, because you know, the other, you know, effect of, of a higher pay out of pocket is I just won't have it done, or uh, I'll, I'll wait till I get the money, of course that never I happens. I believe there is, in fact, I think Cigna put together a program um, over the last few years of the impact of the high deductible health plans that like for me, I, I think it's, I don't even, can't remember, I think it's $3,800 is mine. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some are 5,000. Um, some are less, but then, uh, I'm not gonna get technical, but just a rule of thumb, people will delay a care because it's like, okay, I'm having chest pain, you know, it's $3,800, I think I'll wait. Well, I don't want you to wait. Mm -hmm. So, uh, there has been some of that, and Cigna did show that. And if you look at the data over the years, the cost of a high deductible plan is actually cheaper than where you're at today. It's cheaper. The problem with that is, is that the trend lines have been going like this and they're about even now. So the trends, once that program has been established, it's, the trends are about the same. Now what they don't tell you is this historically, on a high deductible health plan, if it was fully insured or self, you can talk about the premiums all day long, 
if you said we're going to fund this plan at $650 for a single person, a high deductible plan is $500. The city is going to say, we just saved $150. Bucks. Nope. What you're probably going to do is take that $150 and put it in their health savings account. So the contribution by the city is the same. It has no financial impact on the city. Just how do you want the employee to manage their own care? Mm -hmm. And so you've got to be careful on pricing differences because if it's too cheap or really low, everybody's going to take it. And at the end of the year, we don't have $5 million to pay all the claims. It's a weird anomaly because people will look at that. It's like, I'm going to save the money because I don't have any health issues. And there's other people who say, I'm going to pay the premium difference and then use it. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. But there is something on Cigna. I'll see if I can find it and forward it through Natalie for you if you'd like. Mr. Charlesworth, when you say high deductible plan, what kind of deductibles are we talking about? Well, under the, um, the, the IRS guideline, there's, it's, the minimum deductible, I believe, is $1,500. The challenge with that is, is that under the family plan, if you have a family and it's two or three times that amount, this one individual is going to have to meet the family deductible. So if you have a $1,500 individual but 4,500 family and you're on a family, an individual will have to meet $4,500. If it's in what they call embedded, it's $2,850 2850 for 2021. That way, any one individual is capped at $2,850, even though they're on a, health, a family plan that may have a higher family deductible. So rule of thumb for me right now, $2,850 for 2021. Sorry, that's a long answer to a short question. Yeah, and a very convoluted answer, I might say. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. No. <laughs> but yes, just 2850 is the rule of thumb right now for that. Okay, a uh, couple graphs. Uh, you wanted to see kind of how the, the cost flew or flows, if you will. Uh, the green is the fixed cost, which is claims administration, stop loss, network access, and some taxes. The yes, you are subject to some ACA taxes, not much. Uh, $682,000 expected RX claims. This is the number we come up with, about 5.8. Um, expected medical claims. This is on the current funding year. Uh, right at $4 million collectively. Uh, then there's a, that aggregate corridor we talked about, the term, the, the, that 130% corridor. As you can see, currently it's $1.196, $1.2 million. Well, that's fine, but that does not include pharmacy. Okay? Uh, that expected funding change from prior years, about 0.1%. Um, that's using the same number of employees. But collectively, the expected total cost is about $6.3 million as we currently sit today as a city. For 21, what we're looking at, uh, if we, the rate change is actually about 3.9% using 2020 initial enrollment. The enrollment numbers, they change every month, folks, so it's going to skew the numbers a little bit, and that's why that 6.6 .6, uh, rate decrease is skewed, in my opinion. Uh, Six, again, this is the same as we have current pharmacy carve out, 600,000 expected pharmacy claims, medical claims. Again, as you can see, a little bit lower because uh, Blue Cross has a 3.5% uh, renewal projection going forward. Again, this is, these are claim projections. So that's good news about a 4% overall reduction. Uh, and then the third one here is if the city would consider rolling in the medical and pharmacy collectively. As you can see, the fixed cost goes up about $124,000 from about $600 to $729. Medical and pharmacy claims. And then there's that $1.5 million number I talked about earlier. $1 million, $512. That's that aggregate corridor, that 30% difference above expected for worst case scenario. So now you know where I came up with the $1.5 million number when we first started talking. Again, it's about a 2% reduction using the same enrollment numbers. Funding numbers are a little skewed here because of the lower, about nine employees lower. S 
So would we be able to um, combine our pharmacy with Blue Cross Blue Shield for the 2021 year, or are we looking clear down to 2022? We're looking for February 1, 2021. Gotcha. So what's the uh, revenue flow going to look like with uh, that enrollment information? I'm trying to get to uh, what rates will be. In other words, are you saying we can reduce rates by 4.7 percent? I'm probably thinking closer to two. Okay. And part of that's accounting for the employee numbers. That is These correct. assumptions versus what we're seeing. Right. And I just, because you do, have, the city has swings and numbers. Yeah. And I, that's based on that. as it's, we sit today. But I would look is, at. Is that a current count as of, as of last week or whenever this uh, was? That was as of uh, September 1st. Okay. All right. But that's so. a, that scenario is. Stop loss on prescription claims. That is correct. Um, which is an added cost, but offset by other savings. Back to those employee numbers, does that include the subgroups or is that the city only? It's all of them. That's all everybody, okay. So if I, if I recap, I think there's about four decision points here. One is the basis on which we calculate um, a health fund reserve target. Um, along with that then is when and how we calculate that, uh, but also um, if we want to put any strategy in place in advance of if we see reserves in excess or re reserves falling short. So there's two decision points. The other then is whether we want to uh, pursue a stop loss on prescription claims and then lastly uh, change in the plan year um, i think believe it or not given all the financial conversations we've had about financial difficulties um, we are making progress on the general fund reserve we are seeing you know i think we have our finances in check in terms of the general fund we're seeing some opportunity here in the health fund might be a, a uh, you could easily justify saying let's take a conservative approach to the reserve calculation so we build ourselves a little bit of a balance um, and you could also justify the now that we have realized the savings taking on that added expense for the stop loss on prescriptions um, the plan year isn't so much a financial decision as it relates to cost but it's an ongoing frustration and a challenge as we're preparing the budget we don't know what to plan for budget or health expenses. Um, synchronizing that in and of itself from a budget standpoint would be helpful, not to mention the other things that HR mentioned. Um, so you know, as we talk multiple times about where's our fund balance and what are we gonna do with it, this is the type of detail that I wanted to be sure we had before we started making those kind of decisions. Is it an onerous task to match medical expense against pharmacy expense just to see how many potential stop-loss candidates we would have had for this. And again, I don't know if you can, if 2020 is a good year to use, but say 2019. Because, you know, for me, I'm sitting, okay, you got 400 employees, medical expenses, a year and a half later, you probably know what they are. Same for the pharmacy. But if it's not that simple, let me know. <laughs> See, and while we're talking about it, just for the listeners at home, why don't we touch on HIPAA and how we would do that? Oh, right. Yeah, I mean, following, obviously. I mean, for, you know, for your eyes only, we just need, there were eight, there were seven, there were five. Yeah. Um. Uh, I do have business associates agreements with uh, the carrier and the pharmacy provider. Um, I can ask for a uh, encrypted um, top 20, if you will, um, claimants and um, see if there's a way that I can um, combine that. 
Um, and, and the only caveat I might list that, let's just say one of those top two was someone with multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. right. One of those drugs is 80,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Lord help them if they were cancer. Now, if the drug is working, their medical expenses may be almost zero because the drug's working so well. Correct. Uh, so it's kind of those people who are maybe not, it may not be the top, they may not be top performing in, in each group, but their aggregate spending may get them over the 150. Correct. Um, and the reason I said 20, that's usually what I, I get uh, mm -hmm. through a normal report. Uh, all encrypted identifiers, but um, uh, let me visit with Natalie on that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to have to figure out how I can do that um, by still following the business associate agreements uh, for HIPAA protection. Um, right, cause, cause so. It wouldn't surprise me if there were actually several who, when you combine their medical and their pharmacy, or, or maybe this is a is there, is our employee group considered a younger group than most businesses in town, or not necessarily? I didn't pull the average age. Our yeah. average age is mid forties, I believe. The last data that I looked, I don't know about average age of our insurance. Um, so that's why I'm wondering. <coughs> that's true, because it's going to be not just the employees, but the Dependence, yeah. Right. Okay. And the city has, um, second here, I can tell you, unless, Jennifer, do you have the current enrollment? There's several as employee, spouse, and family, correct? I have, well, we consider our plus one spouse or one child. I have 69 enrolled. Um, and Um, here's what I had from the Blue Cross data that was provided for the renewal. This is just, uh, they actually break it down in four tiers for us. Employee, employee spouse, employee child or children and family. But there were 190 employees. There were 63 employee and spouses. That's so that's mm -hmm. 126 people. Mm -hmm. um, 37 mm -hmm. employees with child or children, and then 184 with families. Mm. Right. I think that's, yeah, it's at the bottom of. Yeah, at the bottom of yeah. that worksheet, yeah. that's correct. Uh, yeah. They, I mean, there's a little bit of variation, but yeah. But, oh, between the 2020 and the 2021. So we have four points of decision at this point? I think so. Okay. We don't necessarily need to make a decision today. If you can provide direction, that'd be fine. But I think well, formalizing our the method in which we calculate the reserve balance would be helpful. Formalizing when, in terms of the plan year, we do that would be helpful. Um, and then you will have a decision point as we renew on prescription, whether we want to take on a stop loss for prescriptions. And then lastly is... Um, the plan year, whether we want to. Well, I would that. suggest that uh, what we need is a recommendation from you on each one of those points, and then we can focus our discussion. If we don't do that, we're going to be wandering in the wilderness for some time to come. <laughs> well, I'd be happy to do you that. Know, if, uh, if, uh, and, and maybe we do that at the next meeting or whatever, but I, I would like to have some focal point for the discussion because otherwise we're all going to be all over the board. Sure. Um, and and I'm this way, we can, that this way we can take aim at just one person. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm I here mean, for. Yeah. Um, oh. <laughs> I, I would tell you at this point, g given our financial position at the moment, I think we're well positioned to take a conservative approach to the reserve balance calculation. Um, and while we have the funds versus sweeping them somewhere else, n now would be the time that we could take the more conservative approach to uh, the reserve calculation. I think it does need to synchronize with plan year end so that we know what our terminal exposure is and we can make some of those calculations. Um, 
I think the, the conversation that you've had about trying to hone in a little bit further on our exposure on prescription stop loss is useful, but that uh, uh, if the more we can do an actual cost benefit calculation there, the better, but that's a significant risk. And then lastly, the plan year, um, <laughs> I don't know that we know the rationale why we set it the way that we did, but it, from a benefits administration standpoint as well as a budgeting standpoint, a January 1 plan year would be much more uh, helpful and productive for us. So um, I think the so only... When you say conservative approach, what does that mean? Does that mean we're going to increase the target or reduce the target? Yeah, I'm sorry. I mean fiscally conservative, meaning a higher target. Okay. Um, because we have more money everywhere else. Well, we have we have sufficient funds in the health department reserve fund or the health insurance reserve fund at the moment to meet that goal, and in terms well, of general we, we fund, we already exceed that goal. Right. We correct. We exceed piece. the either one of these goals, um, and the issue of up down swings I think has a lot of validity. We, you know, we we're saying we've had a couple of good years, but. We've had quite a few coming years where we've had the opposite conversation. But if you look so. at the history, our balance has never fallen below the target in the last eight years or so. Right. Um, part My of perspective is, is the balance should be above and below the target consistently, and we need to manage towards the target instead of trying to treat it as a minimum. And if the target is well based on... I want to use the word it's, fact, it's, but it's, it's to, clear to that the it's extent well that you can. Based on Mr. Charlesworth's recommendation, somewhere between two and two and a half million. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I also think that in terms of policy questions, it would probably, it, you know, it would be helpful if we came to some understanding about um, if the results are positive or negative in terms of our balance. Um, are we looking at a premium holiday? Are we looking at reducing um, rates? Are we, you know, how exactly um, are we are we going to manage that? Um, I mean, that's some, that's something that I would at least like to have that I, set out so that everybody's expectations I, I are the agree. same. I would like to see some structure to the discussion, though, so we can talk about prescription plan location is one thing, how we address an overage and the fund balance is another, the target itself is another, um, and then um, I forget what the fourth is, but I think we need to deal with those one at a time instead of each of us talking about a different one as we go through it, and that's why I'm saying I think we need to delay this discussion until next week and either do it as part of the regular meeting with a structured approach rather than have me talk about fund balance target and Commissioner Hodges talk about what do we do if we're above or below it and Commissioner Davis talk about how do we want to do the prescriptions. You know, we, we have to develop a focus on this because we've got four or five decisions here that are somewhat interrelated, but we're going to end up, like I said, wandering in the wilderness if, if we don't get a focus. We Staff can certainly bring that forward to you. We won't have it ready by next week, but we can we can frame it up. We, you know, the, the previous conversation, I felt like there was a lot of pressure to go ahead and make the decision. So the reason we're having the study session conversation is to explain the breadth of the decision points, and we can bring you a recommendation. Are the Blue Cross projections for next year are, are they influenced by what some people consider to be a pent up? demand for service because it wasn't delivered this year yes, as well I, as and were they made early enough in the year to account for what some people think is going to be a bad flu season well th that is a challenge they do take that into consideration yes uh, your claim data was through June so they did see some of that coming back uh, but yes if you they do take that into consideration going forward that's where they come up with their, and of course I gave them claim data as far as the top pharmacy drugs that were used, the top 100 in fact. Um, that way they could see based on the claim data, obviously they couldn't match up the individuals, but they can kind of get an idea of like where do they think their claim costs are going to be based on their discount structure and rebate structure. Um, so that's where they came up with their projection of expected claims 
for your pharmacy? Because yeah, I think pharmacy was probably less affected by yeah, the coronavirus think, look, uh, than, than medical claims. Commissioner Davis, I agree yeah. with you. Because yes. all it, you know, it takes to get a prescription refill is a phone call and you talk to a robot at your pharmacy and you have it. Uh, the, the medical claims part is what I'm, you know, are we going to, and most of these folks probably won't get to 150, but that's more out of our pocket mm -hmm. because it is under 150. And if, if half of 2020's health care is given in 2021, then I, I, I thought Mr. Charlesworth said that they had calculated that to be, be about a 5% input impact, which that is, is considerably less than half. And that, that corresponds with some of the stuff I've read in, in the insurance industry, and I forgot the company na name now, but they're a, one of the world's largest providers, mm -hmm. uh, and I could look it up again. And there, I think the estimates then, and this was a few months ago, were like 3 to 7 percent or something like that, so the 5 percent rings yeah. true, rings about right. That's consistent with what, I, what I've read. That's what we're finding, at least in the Kansas City market and the central Kansas market. I think Blue Cross uses a five percent as a as a as a benchmark. In other words, that's the delay that COVID has caused. That would be the delay. Mm -hmm. delaying. Uh, what do they call optional services? Mm -hmm. You know. Is is it standard or um, normal for a lot of your uh, clients to have the? The employee pay a percent, this basically the same percentage of a individuals they do a family, because a lot of times I've seen where the 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 premium paid by the employee would be considerably more as a percentage of the total premium than just the straight 25 percent basically that we have, because there's a, an obviously a significant benefit to an individual that's on a family versus it's on a single. Uh, we could pull information from a lot of public entities, but a lot of the public entities in which I work with, um, a lot of them have um, two plans, one a high deductible plan and then a, what they call a buyout plan. And many times the lowest cost plan, the city pays 100% of the employee rate. So. Uh, I just worked on a city uh, this morning. Uh, the employee pays 14% uh, and the city pays 86%, regardless of which plan you take. So if you look at uh, some stuff from Mid-America Regional Council and others, you'll find a lot of the public entities, uh, not schools, schools are very different, but for the municipalities and counties, you'll find that they pay a, the bulk of a single rate and then 20 the employee pays 20 to 25 percent of the family rate. That is fairly common. Do you give odds on football games? Oh, sorry, what? Do you give odds on football games? This is, this is. <laughs> All I care is the Chiefs keep winning. <laughs> hey. <laughs> well, there's a lot of forecasting that has to go in. And appreciate the work that, you, that you've done. Any other questions I can answer today for you, commissioners? I don't think so. Any I will try and get <coughs> some of those, um, that information on the high deductible impact as well as if there's a way I can pull the top claimants on both of those. Thank you. I'll endeavor to do that. Mr. Scragg, do you need any more direction from us? And not unless there's additional data or, or questions that you might have. If, if this kind of covers the waterfront in terms of the conversation, then we can certainly bring it back to you as an action item. Just one is, is the difficulty in combining those two lists of top users at the two different companies? It just occurred that the pharmacy benefits are now through a different Two different companies, companies and okay. two, two encrypted systems. All right. In my mind, I was thinking, okay, that company should have these two lists, but it occurred <laughs> to me that's two, so, correct. two companies. <clears throat> okay. and, and if it's not possible, I mean, I don't, I mean, I guess we all have our different preferences on how important um, 
you know, taking a, a, a look at that is. But um, I also, you know, if it's if it's not something that's doable with the encryption and with HIPAA, then I, you know, I think that we make our best guess based upon the information that you've provided us and staff's direction and um, take it from there. Well, all I can give you, and this has been our company's historic perspective, uh, what I would do if it were my company and my money. I'm not shy about telling you that at all. So, so, <laughs> so if it were my, January 1, if it were, if it were my company and my decision, um, what I would look at would be combining the pharmacy and the medical under Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas with the prime therapeutics. At the 150,000 stop loss level to have protection there and the aggregate funding it there. Probably funding it close to where you're funding it today. Um, uh, you can take 2% off. I, I mean, it's, it's city funds and employee funds. Um, I, going down kind of scares me with the issues of what we might see. So I might recommend funding it as you currently fund it today. Um, I would establish at least the first year, uh, I would establish the, uh, the, I, the reserve fund to be a twofold, a minimum of the 2050000 and a not to exceed of the $2.4 million. I'd probably put a range in there if it were my money. Uh, that way I'd have that parameter where we're going or not. Um, that would be decided in October to implement some either refunds or refunding in December. Um, as far as plan year, I think I'd like to wait until 1-1 of 22 to make that decision. Uh, I'd like to weigh the differences of the impact of enrollment uh, and coordination with employees and their spouses, if that's going to be an impact or not. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the question we should have asked about 20 minutes ago. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's not my decision, though, okay? <laughs> Please. Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've looked at the prescription plan in, in the past. That's not always been your recommendation, but it's kind of evolved. Oh, that's, it has not. I mean, it's um, the, the current provider has done a, a, a very, very nice job, in my opinion. Uh, I think the city and the employees have saved money. They've been managed well. They've got some good programs for the employees. Um, I, I just am nervous seeing not just not so much the cities, but our other public clients that we have the impact of pharmacy on on claim de claim costs and how that's controlled and coordinated between stop loss carriers. Um, uh, call me paranoid. Call me what you like, but based on the today's times, I think that would be uh, why I'm making that recommendation this at this point. That's what I would do. I'd pull it all together. The pricing is good. The stop loss is good. It came down. We can roll it in. It, to me, it's just it's it's aligning correctly, and um, it would be a good time to do so. One thing I hadn't thought of, but you just mentioned is is it easy to get a list of the ancillary programs that Elixir currently has that our employees are using that. Prime Therapeutics. They have similar programs. Have similar, yes, okay. we do have that information already. In fact, okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Do we know how long we've been using Elixir or its predecessor name? It seems like they we've been using them for many years. Ten years, probably. Ten years. Commissioner France, I would. I, I think we started probably with Blue Cross Blue Shield and then shifted to them at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, shake your head, Natalie. I don't remember. Oh yeah, that's right. Oh yeah. mercy, don't right. bring that up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that was the reason we uh, recommend the city make a change at that time. Right. Okay. If there's no more questions, I guess we'll be back in here at four o'clock for the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Shanna Goodley, we dread. <laughs>